Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and a well and a very warm welcome uh, to all of you in this six, 15th uh, episode of the Let's Talk Primary Healthcare uh, series of the Joey Joe uh, Primary Health Center uh, based in Almaty. Today is a very special day. Our topic will focus on the managing performance in primary health care. A managing performance in primary health care, this is a great opportunity to measure and at the same time to track many of the dimensions of primary health care. But how to turn this information into action at clinical, at managerial, and at policy level? Turning this information is a challenge, but at the same time, we should have faith that with these measurements and with this information, we are able to make the right and the best decisions. So for that, this will be some of the questions that I will raise to our panelists. And welcome to the panel session. And in this moment, what we are offering you is to keep the discussion not just for this hour but to keep the discussion in our round tables that will continue just after this panel debate for that you will be able to join either to one round table in english or another one in russian language but during the panel session we invite you to say hello in the chat and at the same time what we are going to offer you is a, a sort of good uh, links of information that you it will be uploaded in the chat so for that i'm going to introduce and welcome the panelists so we've got with us today thank you very much for joining welcome uh, in the first time, at the first site, I'm going to introduce Nick Kazinga. Nick Kazinga is professor of social medicine at the University Medical Center of the University of Amsterdam. Hello, uh, Nick. We've got with us Erika Barbadza. Erika Barbadza is a researcher on healthcare performance intelligence. She is working at the Marie Curie Innovative Training Network of the University of Amsterdam as well in the Netherlands. And then we've got two family medicine doctors. Helemal Sadrak, she is a family doctor and member of the board of the family doctors of Estonia. Welcome, uh, Helemal. And we've got Vera Pires da Silva Vera is also a family medicine doctor and she's the coordinator of the regional uh, team for primary health care support at the area of Lisbon and Tar Tagus uh, River in Portugal. So welcome all of you. And with this, I would like to start uh, our first round of discussion. And I'll start with a very generic uh, uh, question that we can go in deep with it. So the key generic question is why should countries invest in actionable primary health care performance measurement? So this is the key question. And I'm going to ask uh, a question to, to Nick. Nick, you let's start with you. Um, and I would like to listen your perspective from the regional and uh, multi-country approach on that. Repeating the same, qu uh, the same question, why countries should invest on managing performance in primary health care? And the second question, Nick, is this a priority in many countries? And do they take advantage 
of all the digital solutions and all the digital opportunities that offer that we have uh, on the table right now. Nick, please. Thank you, Tony, and thanks for uh, inviting me to participate in this, uh, this panel. On your first question, yes, it is important to have performance intelligence on primary health care. And for different reasons, as you stated in your introduction, it's used by clinicians to do their work better. It's needed by managers to see whether primary care is doing the things it should do. And it's very much needed by policymakers to see whether as a whole, the primary care system is functioning in the whole healthcare system. On the clinical level, that means that you're not just running from one patient to the other, but you have overview in what the outcome of the healthcare activities you do is, 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 is happening, is there. And you really can focus on the population you're serving. So you try to put more emphasis on prevention and looking at the overall uh, all outcomes. On the managerial level, you want to know what models work. We have shortages of personnel. We have always limited financial means. So in that situation, can you really get the best out of your <coughs> primary care system? And that's extremely important for policymakers as WHO is really pushing the strengthening of primary health care. We put a lot of, of <coughs> investments in it. Is it delivering? And not just in words, but can I see in the reduction of the number of people with chronic diseases admitted avoidable to hospitals? Is that happening in your country? Is there a more rational use of medication use? For that, we need actionable information, meaning we need the information in time and we need the right indicators. And COVID has learned us that such information is key. And yes, for the second part, you need a good digital infrastructure in your country <coughs> to do that. And having a strong data infrastructure in primary care is at, the, at the, the key at the bottom of the overall information infrastructure in a country. So are all countries doing that? Many at the moment are, are investing in improving the digital infrastructure, in increasing interoperability, secondary data use, introducing telemedicine, but it really needs an more effort to maximize the benefits that are potentially there to really build uh, resilient healthcare systems. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. And, and I'm going to go to Erica now. And Erica, Nick has made a clear case for investing in performance management and data actionability. And, but why now? And you as a researcher, Erica, um, you can make this case uh, and, and why uh, the research that you are doing and could you give us some idea and for our attention that why we should put this here and now? Erica, please. Thanks, Tony, and thanks for having me. Uh, well, first to comment uh, as to why our attention is turning to actionability and the use of primary care data now. I think the main reason here is because the context of measurement in primary care is changing. And there's a couple of causes for that. Uh, one is that primary care data is increasingly digitalized. So we have new volumes of data and potential to link those sources in ways that was just previously not the case in primary care. We also have uh, new tools that are increasingly present in the health sphere in general that offer ways to analyze and visualize information uh, in ways that are real time and interactive and customizable. And this really took off during the COVID pandemic, and it's now set in some ways a new precedent of what is expected of our data sources. So it means the lament that we don't have data and tools in primary care is just not really the case anymore. And then at the same time, we have also seen in our studies around creating healthcare performance intelligence, the focus or the importance of focusing on actionability. So for example, we did a study uh, in the context of the Netherlands, which is a really data rich context for primary care around optimizing the use of primary care prescribing data. And what we found uh, there was that while well, some considerations for improving secondary use were related to the data itself. So for, for example, things like uh, improving the linkages between data sources. We also found that resolving data, bar data related barriers alone would not increase the use of prescribing data. 
And I think that's really important for our uh, discussion today, as it really underlines that our attention is needed to other areas as well, like the development of strategic and purpose-driven indicators and their embedding in cycles and systems of governance and management, which is really the essence of uh, prioritizing actionability. I'll stop there. So thank you. Thank you very much, Erica. And I'm going to go to Ella Moll now. Um, Ella, you are a family medicine doctor, and we are moving from the research to the practice. And what are the benefits of primary health care performance measurement uh, in your daily basis? As Nick already said, uh, that many countries are facing similar problems. Uh, for example, the aging population, the lack of doctors, the nurses, and uh, we in Estonia have the same problem. I think many of uh, people who are listening today also have the problem. And we need to work smarter. We don't need to work harder, but we need to work smarter. And that's the reason you should uh, think where your focus should be. Should it be on the everyday uh, uh, putting the fire out with the emergent patients, acute situations you need to focus? Or are those the patients uh, who will somehow develop something, complications uh, in a longer, longer run? And we have seen that uh, focusing on uh, performance management has helped uh, us to do proactive work with those patients who actually need and uh, we can prevent some complications and uh, reduce hospitalization and work on uh, the compliance to drugs. So I think those are the man biggest benefits as a doctor. I can see if you have a good uh, system, how the performance management works, then you will see actual, actual uh, uh, focus groups you need to focus on. Thank you very much, Alamo. And now I'm going to go to Vera. And uh, beyond the immediate clinical advantages described, um, I would like to, to hear what are the other opportunities, Vera, for um, um, learning opportunities or for peer review uh, in, in your experience? Thank you. Um, a lot has already been said, but what I what I can really focus on is if we as physicians want to understand the impact of our actions in our patients, we need data. And that's what primary health care performance management allows. It allows us to have a continuously available data on our results and to check if they are in line with targets defined according to best practices. It allows me to compare my results with my peers, either within my team, but also regionally and nationally? Am I providing the best care to my patients according to standards? If not, what strategies should I focus on? And this enables to exchange the exchange of good practices between colleagues. It also allows me and my team to learn and make use of our own autonomy and determine which areas should we improve. This is micro level, but this can also be made in meso and macro level, which answer to the questions, how is our healthcare system doing? So to sum up, if we want to improve, first, we need to have a picture of what's going on to be able to navigate through the results and then adjust our performance to improve clinical care, which is the most important to our patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vera. And I'd like to go to the, uh, uh, the, round, the second round of, of, uh, of discussion. And I'd like to continue putting the spotlight on good practices. And in this case, um, Erica, you invest lots of your time and res in research and your efforts in, in research and performance uh, measurement. So my question uh, is, could you share with us some good examples that help turn data into actionable uh, solutions? Thanks, Tony. Please. Thanks. Well, uh, well, first to perhaps discuss a bit about the meaning of actionability, because in fact, that has been a, a big focus of our research is to better understand what makes indicators useful or rather actionable. And what we found has uh, is related to its two key elements. The first being fitness for purpose. 
where fitness for purpose really reflects the extent to which the information answers or meets a clear information need. And here we found the opportunities to be more precise. So it's not enough to put indicators in big buckets for clinicians at the micro level, uh, at the meso level for organizations or macro level policymakers. We really need to be more specific about uh, who, who our end user of performance information is to know exactly what their what is in fact their information need. Because for example, if we take the policymaker perspective, we will need different information if we're asking and answering, how is my healthcare system doing? versus our primary care services being delivered as intended. And we found opportunities to really strengthen our fitness for purpose by, by rooting our measurement efforts in really well-defined strategic uses and clear users. The, the second part of actionability is related to its fitness for use. And fitness for use really challenges us to see an indicator and its measurement as the process that it is. Uh, and what it takes to manage that whole process from selecting indicators to um, collecting the data, analyzing, reporting, and visualizing that information, and ultimately delivering it to decision makers. A second component of fitness for use is, is thinking about indicators in the context they'll be used, meaning considering things like the governance system and the underlying information system as well as the capacity professionals to make use of that information and uh, draw on it in their decision making. And then a third and last component is more methodological and related to the indicator itself. So to be sure that we're choosing indicators that, for example, uh, are clearly, clearly indicate a target to the end user of where they can take action and make improvements. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Erika. And now um, let's hear about two of our countries represented uh, today in the panel. And, but for that, uh, I would like to, to invite you to watch a video, a very specific one that it demonstrates uh, the use of the primary health care performance dashboard in practice from Portugal is a recording uh, that Vera is, is, is shared with us. So please, let's watch the video now. In 2005, there was an important uh, primary health care reform in Portugal. What this reform introdu introduced was a change of the culture of primary health care, and the main characteristics were the establishment of multidisciplinary primary care centers with family doctors, nurses, and secretaries, but also an integrated primary care performance monitoring system was developed. to optimize healthcare processes and outcomes. This performance monitoring system uh, as a software that covers 100% of all primary care providers in our national health systems and more than a thousand of primary healthcare centers have adopted and integrated uh, in, their uh, in their platforms and also more than 20,000 health care workers use it. Indicators are collected across several domains, for example, hypertension, diabetes, cancer screening, mental health, women's health, family planning, maternal health, and also youth and child health. So on the screen, you can see our dashboard. This is for a specific health center. You can find listed all the indicators and the scoring system. And this scoring system is based based on the fact that each indicator has a target with boundaries. For example, this indicator mon monitors the proportion of diabetes of diabetic uh, patients with a blood pressure above uh, 140 and 90. So this is diabetics who don't have their blood pressure con control. In this case, the lowest the number, the better the results. Uh, the sum of the old indicators will give you the performance global index that you can find uh, on the top of the, your dashboard. In this case, it was 80.3. In the next dashboard I'm going to show you is that you can also use this dashboard to compare results uh, from of each indicators with other regions. In Portugal, we have five health regions, and this dashboard shows the result for the same indicator I just talked about. On top, you can find the year, the month, and the specific indicator you can uh, that you are evaluating. On the top right, 
you can see that we have 5,452 family ductus in Portugal. Um, and then on the yellow bars graph graphic top left, you have the results of, for the five regions which are all monitoring the same indicators. Uh, the next dashboard I'm going to show you is also uh, a dashboard that allows to compare results within uh, clusters of health centers. Each region, each, each of the five regions have clusters of health centers. This is from the, uh, the cluster of health centers from Cascais. And you can see that for the same indicators that we were talking uh, uh, since the beginning, the difference between all the family, the, all the primary care units and you can see that some have better results than others the ones that has the best results it is the second from the line uh, from left and you can uh, from right sorry uh, and you can see uh, that is a unit that is also as a model with a pay for performance um uh, pay for performance system Thank you for the video, but now I'm going back to Vera in, 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 real, in real life. So first of all, thank you very much for helping us recording this video. And uh, I'm, I guess you'd like to add something else. Uh, from, but my direct question to you is, does this dashboard help you in the daily practice? <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your question. Yes, it does help to make uh, better decisions as the system is oriented towards health gains. We have regular feedback on our performance. Each month, we have access to our results, and that allows implementing corrective measures when needed. It also allows benchmarking, compare results across the country, and therefore promotes also the dissemination of the best practices. One thing it's also important at is that this dashboard, dashboard promotes teamwork because many indicators have targets that are reachable by doctors and or nurses. So the team has common goals and is working towards improving clinical care. We are assigned with a mission to accomplish and we are given freedom and autonomy to do it. It is also important to mention that this dashboard is based on an electronic health record system, which, which software is developed and maintained by the health ministry and has proved to be cost effective since the lack of licensing fees and other external requirements. And we healthcare workers don't have to pay to use it. Uh, another point that I would also like to add is that it also allows to set clear expectations as we know the indicators and the targets for each year, so we know which areas are considered. So to sum up, this uh, performance monitoring system is important to guide the decisions of health healthcare system actors, be it national or regional uh, policy makers, healthcare managers, and also clinicians. And it also supports a value-based healthcare and a pay for performance system. So it, it is a useful system. Also, obviously it has some barriers and some things that we'll discuss after, but uh, to, in generally, globally, we can consider it was a, you know, a very good, important um, uh, outcome that you have in Portugal. Uh, thank you, Vera. And now from Portugal, we are going to go to Estonia. And with Estonia, hello, Mol. Uh, we know that Estonia is a pioneer in performance uh, management and at the same time in digital solutions. But tell us what are the strengths and the weaknesses of the performance monitoring system in, in Estonia. And I'd like also to ask, uh, do you feel that this system, as I ask Vera, is really helping you in the decision process? Okay. Hello, uh, thank you for the questions. Um, first, I would like to tell this. Uh, in 2006, the performance management became mandatory in Estonia. And uh, by making it mandatory, we actually got the... I can't say that we got all the doctors and nurses on board, but we definitely made a huge uh, step uh, forward uh, having uh, to implement the performance management. I think coming from a, a former Soviet uh, Union country where we have doctors who are still uh, from that area, era, and if they know that you get money for having some kind of results, 
then it's really important, like Erica said, to choose the indicators wisely. It's not, uh, it's not uh, useful to put their indicators where doctors can fill in the answers by themselves. So the digital solution helps us a lot. We don't use uh, blood pressure uh, numbers in Estonia as an indicator for that reason, for the, uh, for the cultural background we have. We use things we can measure, things that our health insurance fund collects uh, from digital. The doctors can't change it. And I think it's a benefit. It's a plus, but it's a minus as well. It's a minus because uh, you measure is something done, but you don't measure what the outcome is. You measure, for example, uh, for diabetic patients, has the, ha has the patient seen a doctor? Has the patient had had some blood tests needed? But you don't measure what happened uh, to the result. If the, uh, the, the sugar was high, did they change the medication or not? So that's the minus we have in our system. But the biggest uh, advantage that we have for the last two years is that we have evidence-based decision-making uh, tool implemented our, on our dashboard, our workly dashboard. We don't have to go to a, a different uh, website to see where am I and what to do with this special patient. Or our national guidelines are implemented in this evidence-based uh, decision-making tool, and it has helped uh, doctors to achieve much better uh, results than never before. So I think this is a good side we have. Thank you, thank you so much, LMO. And, and it's impressive this uh, cultural transformation that you, you shared with us, and 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 in the world you are living now, and the engagement of of all the healthcare professionals. So, but now, um, uh, Nick, you've been very patient in this, in the, uh, listening to to uh, our colleagues, and. I'd like to I'd like to hear from you. What are your reflections about these good practices, and if you could bring some of the features that you would underline about one of the good practices, Nick? No, thank you, and it was a pleasure to listen. So that it's good, and it, it's always good to hear what what happens in in countries like uh, like Estonia and Portugal that really made an investment in strengthening the performance measurement in primary healthcare. And I think in, in both stories, you, you hear the combination of a technical approach and, a, and a human approach of, of, of stakeholders working together. So for the technical story, yes, um, perhaps we discuss it later, but that's a matter of standardization, uh, building your, your information infrastructure around the guidelines and the standards you already have for your, your professions. Uh, having a unified coding and a and, uh, coding and language system. And it tremendously helps if you have a unified electronic health record in primary healthcare, which I know in many countries is at this moment not the case. And it's still one point of things that need standardizing. But the other story is the interoperability. Has the government facilitated the linkage between primary care practices and hospitals and, uh, and pharmacies? And basically, is there a national information infrastructure, including the use of secondary data that, 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 that has been modified? But the human side is as important. What you heard in both Estonia and Portugal, that there's a strong cooperation between the profession, the management, and the persons in, and parties involved in the governance. And of course, that's a win-win situation. Because the worst what you can do is to start from the government, not discuss with your professionals, just pick a, a set of indicators that come from another country and start imposing that on primary health care. That will not work, but it also will take a lot of your resources, will create a lot of tension between parties. So if you can build the trust between the professionals, the managers and the policy makers in, in making this work and then we heard in, in the example of the in, in involvement of government and insurance insurers. Yes, then you create by mutual trust a data infrastructure that is beneficial for the different purposes, because then you have the basic data structure in place and you can target the fit for purpose indicators as, uh, as, as was said for diabetes. As a GP, you basically want to know 
what are my patients with diabetes? Are they in control? Do they think? But in the long term, you want to know, can I avoid them going to hospitals? And in the even longer term, on a regional level, you want to know who ended up with an amputation or, an, uh, oh, or, 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 or a kidney kidney problem or, or eye problems. So from system management, those are the steps, but it's always a combination of the technical opportunities, but in reality, the real problem is to get sufficient trust and cooperation between the various stakeholders to make this happen. Thank you, Nick. Thank you very much. And I'd like now in this, uh, we are entering the third round of the discussion, and I would like to focus on the, on the barriers of the effective use of, of data uh, and actionable uh, performance uh, management. Um, I would like uh, to be a sort of a, a rapid fire here. Uh, I would like you just to, to be very sharp and in one minute each, more or less. So just Tell us about the barriers that you think about uh, the use, effective use of data. I'll start now with Vera. And Vera, based on your daily work, what are the main barriers? So, okay. the, Vera, please. Yes. The first one, I would say it's trust. If you don't have a performance management system that collects accurate data, on a transparent way, according to prioritized areas and based on solid clinical criteria, healthcare workers will not trust the system. And if they don't trust the system, they will not use it to improve clinical care. And it's also important, as Nick said, that policymakers and healthcare managers trust also clinicians and their work. I would also add as a barrier, a misaligned accountability expectations. If the system is too complex, it can quickly compromise a healthy performance, improving dynamics, dynamic. Indicators and targets can be challenging, but must be feasible. Otherwise, the system won't work. And also, at last but not least, as I have only have one minute, I would mention the lack of financing structures to ensure the workforce is paid for their time to use data and improve performance. This is not Hollywood. Clinicians cannot be everything, everywhere, all at once. They need time and they need to be paid accordingly. Thank you very much. And um, Elomol, you are also a, a clinician, a family medicine doctor. And do you see any other important barriers? Yeah, one of the biggest uh, barriers is if uh, is about the data. Is the data accurate? Is it complete data you have? If there's uh, problems with the data, th this will be difficult as well. And the, the biggest thing I have faced in Estonia is the resistance to change the work. If you have used to work in a certain way, it's really difficult to start thinking the other way if you don't understand the benefits of doing something smarter. And uh, as Vera said, I, I'd like to emphasize on the complexity. If the system is too complex, people don't want to participate it. Thank you. And now I'm going to Nick, uh, from the organization and governance perspective, uh, what are your reflections? Well, to identify the barriers, they, of course, the opposite of what you want. You want to build the system on, on trust and learning. And the opposite is distrust. Certain parties, professionals not trusting the government, citizens, which is an important part, I hope you discuss about that too. Not, not trusting the government. So if there is trust and tension and there's just a short-term positioning, it, uh, it, 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 it won't work. And instead of learning, if all the systems are set up by distrust, by just more and more emphasis on accountability and control, in the long term, that will be a, 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 a lost case. So we can see, but we wouldn't need time for that, that all the systems that try to set up big control and accounting systems to manage in the long term, it costs a lot of energy and it creates a lot of tension. So I would, I'm going for trust and learning and I'll try to break down the barriers that are hindering that. Thank you, Nick. And, and now, Erika, uh, with your researcher heart, any other considerations you'd like to add to what uh, the rest of panelists have said? 
Yeah, thanks. I mean, I think I would just underscore those barriers specifically related to data. So some considerations there. One is the data availability, which has already been mentioned, where we're still lagging behind. A uh, second is uh, data quality. So there are uh, aspects like regulations for better standardized and structured primary care data is still a challenge. And then the third is more of an access to data issue and reflects a bit of the design of our information systems, where we still need to be thinking through and configuring our systems with secondary uses in mind, which means addressing um, sort of lingering barriers related to privacy considerations and interoperability of different data sources, because we know that the data is more fit for use when we bring different data sources uh, together to be drawn on. So thank you, thank you so much, uh, Erica. And now um, we have come to the most inter interesting part of our discussion. This is about solutions. So um, what policies and practices do you think are essential to strengthen primary healthcare performance management? And in addition, uh, I know that uh, uh, my colleagues are just uploading some uh, references and, and, and interesting links here. And I'd like to ask you, would you like uh, to share some of the, the key uh, resources that the audience could, could uh, uh, explore? So I'll start with Erica. So I give the floor to you, Erica, just to respond to those two, two questions. If you, you can guide the audience uh, uh, with some resources as well, and with the first question about what are the policies and practices do you think essential? Yeah, great, Erica? thanks. And I, I think there's a lot of reasons to be optimistic in terms of when it comes to solutions and also quickening uh, progress in primary care measurement and management. So I think it's great. We're, um, ending on a positive note and, and focusing on the solutions. Uh, and I think there's a few areas where we can be putting our attention to strengthen our measurement efforts. One we've already talked about around intensifying collaborations and uh, different stakeholder engagement. We really need cross-country efforts to make progress on, on areas like uh, setting common data standards, identifying common indicator sets, and also methods for better national, but also pan-European and global primary care uh, monitoring. And here there's tools like the new uh, global primary healthcare monitoring framework, which is a great resource. And I think that's one that's being put in the chat. Uh, another area for continued investment, as I just mentioned, is our data sources. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done to really unlock the potential of our primary care data. Uh, be it from the physician's office, but also pharmacies, labs, linking with secondary care and social care. And as I mentioned previously, the data standards and improving data quality for its secondary use is key. Uh, another aspect of a, sort of a, a realm for tapping into solutions uh, are those digital solutions like we saw with the example of uh, the dashboard. Uh, which is really offering us opportunities to better analyze and communicate uh, our results. And as we're coming out of the pandemic, these tools were really put to the test and applying the lessons learned from that and expanding the range and uses of dashboards is an area where I think primary care really stands to benefit and has a chance to sort of shift gears and focus more on data use. Um, and on that, it will be really important to be clear on who our audiences are. So we differentiate uh, between dashboards that are intended for primary care clinicians versus facility managers versus regional health authorities or um, policymakers. Because just like when we're selecting indicators on the output side, it's not a one size fits all solution. And just in closing, one uh, additional tool to highlight, or it's rather a guide uh, that maps out some of the points that we've talked about today, is um, uh, we've looked to explore different considerations around uh, selecting actionable healthcare performance indicators. And I believe that's been uh, put in the chat as well, and hopefully can be a good resource of, of having an overview of the considerations to, to keep in mind uh, when going through that process. 
Thank you, Erica, and especially thank you because uh, our audience is very varied with different backgrounds, and you've given us a big, big, broad view and of, of possible resources for that. And now um, I would like to, uh, to give the floor uh, to Nick, um, just to reflect on not just the resources, that it will be an added value here because you as a professor in social medicine, so it will be a very good angle uh, to approach. But at the same time, um, explain us or tell us from your academic experience about solutions. Nick? I'll try, try to be brief um, and just build on my previous interaction yet that the solutions are partly technical, partly human and, and, and cooperational. Erika gave already <clears throat> great uh, sources to, to go. We heard the, how the, the process went in, in Portugal and Estonia. And I'm personally, and as one of the members of the, the WHO Collaborating Center in Amsterdam on, uh, on, on quality and equity in primary care, been involved in, in three rounds of working with six countries that over a longer period tried to implement projects on performance management in, uh, in primary health care. <clears throat> I learned a lot there, but it kind of reinforced my idea that it, it's always a combination of the technical part and that can be thought. Happy to, to link you to other sets of indicators and data systems and things there, <clears throat> but it's really the, the governance part that is important. And just to add two components there, really make sure that your improvement cycles, I'm doing this with my hands because that's for me is learning. It's a cycle. I have actionable information and I get better and better and better and better but you have to link the improvement cycles on the micro, the meso and the macro level, on the clinical level, the managerial and the governance level. There needs to be a cascading, the data need to be the same in the record, but there needs to be a cascading function of data that are filling indicators that are used by a GP, <clears throat> by the, the, the manager of, uh, of, of primary care centers and by the region, regional policy makers. That's an important point, last minute, we didn't <clears throat> discuss patients and citizens. What I see is that the, in the information architecture, many countries are looking at ways of optimizing <clears throat> also the, the involvement of patients and citizens in their own care by making them a full partner in the sharing of information <laughs> and, and access. So if we speak about digitalization and, and, pa and, and, and patient and citizen portals, that's another part. So <clears throat> yes, those, those are the steps forward and yeah i'm convinced and the literature shows so that that the public reporting just showing what the outcomes are achieves the, the credibility of making all these investments in uh, primary health care but also builds on the trust for for citizens and, and patients to be, be involved in sharing their data because people see <clears throat> that it's used for handling things and in that sense the, the pandemic was a kind of accelerator in, uh, for the policy processes that are now put in place in uh, in member of the WHO member states. So thank you so much, Nick. And I, I would like to just to uh, reinforce one 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 information that you you shared with all the audience um, in the in the uh, co-organized and the, the co-shared course uh, between the Co-Writing Center of the University of Amsterdam and the WHO Center for Primary Health Care. Uh, we we have now. 18 countries that they've gone through this performance monitoring uh, uh, course. And I think what, what we, when, once we said, we want information to be actionable, data to be actionable. I think we should look at the future and what is the result of these courses and what are the concrete performance monitoring uh, 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 programs or strategies that are implemented at each of those 18 countries. So thank you for uh, your collaboration in this excellent course. And we hope to launch the, the fourth cohort uh, in the next year. So, and many of the, the audience, I guess, you've been taking part of that course. So that will be very interesting for you to participate and share your experience during, uh, during the, the breakout sessions. We'll give the, the microphone to you in the breakout sessions. So please uh, stay with us. And now I'm going to, to, uh, to uh, address to Ella Moll. Ella, what are your thoughts on that, please? First. Uh, we wouldn't be here today 
if there would be one good solution. Then I think all the countries would have adopted a very good uh, performance management system and we wouldn't be, need to be here. And I think Nick and Erika uh, probably know that the, the different countries have different systems and all the systems have some really good things and some things that could be much better, but somehow they work in their own countries. And the same is in Estonia as well. Uh, my solution would be the goals have to be clear. Everyone needs to know why do you need to do it? This is the main uh, key thing you need to understand if you want to implement something new. And the other thing that is really important and I think essential is uh, the clinical expertise. You have to have uh, clinicians on board if you want to have um, some kind of a performance management system because the clinicians are the ones who can actually say that uh, this uh, area needs some improvements. What kind of improvements could they be? What can they do actually if the government says, oh, we need uh, less diabetic patients, but as a clinician, I know I can't do anything about it because it's a bigger issue than on my hands. And uh, the clinicians also need to interpret the, the data given to them. And I really like the cascade, uh, what both Nick and Erika said. The information available to clinicians is, I think it should be different than the one that's uh, uh, visible and accessible to governmental level, because we need different information. And what else I really would like to emphasize on the second thing. It's um, if the uh, clinician knows why do I do something and uh, can see the results of their actions, then they will probably feel much better in the system and they want to improve. Uh, and they know that this extra work Proactive work is usually extra work, will pay up in the end. Thank you, Elamo. Uh, I really like uh, something that you said. It's about uh, let's design the performance monitoring uh, for the end user. So, and you said that that should be adaptable to the end user, being a manager, being a clinician, being a, a decision maker or, or a politician, or as well, in terms of accountability, being for the general population. So uh, I like your points very much, uh, Elamol. And now let's hear from Vera. Vera, uh, you've shown us the dashboard that shared with this transparency approach that Portugal is had towards uh, the performance monitoring. What else could you add to all what you've been hearing here? Vera, please. Thank you. Well, what I think is essential to strengthen the primary healthcare performance management is improving the use of existing primary healthcare data collection. First, by ensuring that healthcare workers know how to use the system and know where to register the information, information so that the collection is as accurate as possible. Uh, also, it is important to use and to have an electronic health record system shared by all providers to avoid unnecessary duplication of medical services. Some patients may be referred to secondary care, and if so, there's no need to duplicate appointments in order to get the indicator and the targets. We should also consider the use of AI for the recognition of patterns uh, of morbidity and individual risk to recognize uh, individuals who are at high risk and may benefit from specific intervention. That said, focus more on patients, uh, on patients' needs and less on diseases because patients are not all the same and not all can be standardized and targets may not be normalized for all patients. And also, it's really important to reduce administrative overloads and make performance management focused on patient needs based on a simple and fair system concerned about quality and not just the quantity of services provided. 
um, and it is essential to, to carefully select indicators and be sure that they are fit for, for purpose and what they intend to monitor really adds health gains to the population. Otherwise, it may only add burden to clinicians. So rationalization is also important. And to end, and because we are talking about patients and their experience and expectations are also, in, are also important on performance monitoring system, I think we should also consider, consider including PROMS as patient reported outcome measures and PREMS as patient reported experience measures as indicators of performance satisfaction, because at the end, this is what we are really working for, for our patients to provide good clinical care in ways that are aligned with their expectations and experiences. So this would be my main points to strengthen the system. Thank you. So thank you so much, Vera. And, and this is, uh, in a way, we've concluded with a, with a panel discussion, but I would like to thank you for your insights, your thoughts, and your reflections. And I know that there is lots more to keep discussing. I don't know how many of you uh, panelists, there are panelists, can still keep with us uh, in the, what's going to happen next is the, we'll invite you to the uh, round tables uh, that there will be one in Russian and the other one in, in English, uh, co-moderated by colleagues uh, from uh, uh, the WHO. And one of the things uh, uh, we are going to, uh, to transmit you is that please feel free to express and to share your country experience. We had the opportunity to listen from Estonia and from Portugal, but we know that you are, there are many other countries here. And another thing is that if the panelists stay with us, you have the opportunity to keep this discussion ongoing. For that, uh, one of the things we are going to do is we are going to keep this webinar uh, window open until you all can join uh, the breakout rooms. So uh, we'll keep this open. And one thing that I'm going to ask you, when you disconnect, you will receive a survey in a pop-up window. And we would really appreciate it if, um, if you respond that, because it's very important for us to hear from what you think about how this talk show is going. So please, Fill in is both in English and is uh, English and Russian. So uh, please do that. And with this, I would like to say goodbye and thank you for your attention. And we are looking forward to seeing you in the in the breakout sessions. And my final word uh, and message to you is that I'll uh, uh, is I'm going to tell you about the, our next talk show. That will be on the 27th of June, at the same time as, as today, in a new episode, and it will be about the role of primary health care on a well-being economy. And with that, I would like to say thank you very much to all of you, and you have just wait uh, uh, until the, till the window. Uh, uh, you can, can have access to the, to the uh, breakout rooms. And looking forward to seeing you in the breakout rooms until the next episode as well. Thank you very much for being with us.